In this HVACR training video, I'm going over this version of an electric expansion valve. I'll be cutting open the inside so that you can see the pin assembly. I'm gonna be cutting this open so you can see the gearing. I'm gonna show you how this is wired and how to power it in order to move the pin up and down and how this differs from an EEV that has a stainless steel shell and a black plastic head. Now this version of an EEV is also referred to as a linear expansion valve because of the gearing inside. And the object of a LEV, a linear expansion valve, or an EEV is to meter the refrigerant flowing through here. So this is referred to as a metering device. And there's a little tiny pin that's gonna be able to move down to close off the pathway right here, where it's gonna move up to allow more refrigerant through. And so this version of the LEV or EEV is commonly found in VRF indoor units and mini VRF indoor units. So this here is a slim duct unit out of a VRF system, and that's a variable refrigerant flow system. And with these style systems, you have an EEV or an LEV at the indoor unit. So that differs from a mini split indoor unit, such as this slim duct unit, because there is no metering device at this unit, and it's only in the outdoor unit. And speaking of mini splits, if you want to learn more about them, make sure to check out our inverter mini split operation and service procedures book. So we go over all the electrical components in there and the refrigerant based components and how to get a system up and running. And so right here, underneath of this nut, you're going to have some thread seal on the threads just to make sure that it doesn't loosen up over time. And you're going to have a little gasket here. And so if you were to replace this head assembly, You'd want to make sure that there's no refrigerant in this system, otherwise it's going to be coming out through the top. So I know that looks like a lot of movement, but it's really not. It's only an eighth of an inch, and I could push this up a little bit, not much. And so this little pin right here is controlling the amount of refrigerant flowing through into the evaporator coil. And so there's a lot of control with this version of an EEV. It takes a lot of electrical pulses in order to move this pin position to adjust it. And so there's a little retaining ring right here, the spring, and then another retaining ring up here. And then up at the top, this is where the, the head pushes down at right here. And then this is where it seals up against it with a little gasket. So we would have the thread sealer here and right here, that black uh, piece, that's the gasket. And so down inside, you see the stainless steel pin that's almost flush with the little brass section right there. And if we were to try to get the EEV to close. This pin would be pushing the other pin downwards to close off the body of the EEV. And so that's about an eighth of an inch of movement. Now to fully open or fully close this, it's gonna take a massive amount of 12 volt pulses in a sequence uh, on four coils up here. Now two of these wires right here are commons. And so they lead over to uh, the sets of coils. And then the other four, which are right here, have to be powered in a certain sequence. And so you can see there's a coil right up here at the top. It's actually two sets of coils at the top, and then there's another two down here. Now, as the power pulses are being applied, it's actually spinning this little magnet on the inside. And so you see there's a little gearing here. And so there's gearing on the inside. So that center one right there is then turning the outside gear, which is turning these other gears and eventually end up making this little pin assembly, which is attached to, to this gear right here. It's making it rise or fall, basically. It's, it's lowering it or uh, rising it right there. And you can see there's actually threading on it. And so that's all done by the gearing. Well, now what this does is it gives it more strength on this pin. So if there's maybe uh, some gunk on the inside of the body here, it's going to actually kind of force through it and kind of push it down. And uh, also due to very high pressures, it's able to fight against that as well in order to adjust this pin position with the gearing. So the advantages here are that it has many, many, many steps of control in order to control the pin position, as well as it being very strong in order to push up or down the pin in order to open or close the pin position on the body. And as you can see, this is the fully open position, by the way. It doesn't get any more open than this, and then it just pushes down from there. Now, it's very important to know there is no circuit board in here at all. And so it's just two sets of coils in this section right here and two sets of coils down in here and there's iron teeth on the inside. And here you can see your magnet with your gearing. And so this just sits down inside. 
and that moves due to the magnetic field being applied by this coil. And so you can see there's teeth right here. And so anytime that you power a coil, it's going to make a magnetic field. So it'll be like north here and then south on this side. And so those teeth on the bottom, maybe they would be south and these will be north. And so what's gonna happen is these teeth are gonna be now horizontal because they're on the inside of here. And so basically what's gonna happen is this inside section is gonna turn just a little bit. It's gonna turn just a hair. Then after that, you're gonna be powering this coil down here and it's gonna turn again. It's gonna to align to those teeth. And let me show you why. On this uh, permanent magnet right here, there's multiple north and south poles on it. So let me take that out and show you. So right here we have our magnet and there's a lot of north and south poles on here. You just don't see them. And so we're aligning with this magnet right here. So right before the arrow, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And so we got right back to our starting point right here. So that's how that works. And so that's really, you have 12 north and 12 south on this. So you have 24 poles in order to make one full revolution. So you'd need 24 pulses of 12 volt in order to rotate this one time. But because of the gearing on the inside, it works differently than this other version that we're used to. That magnet is directly connected to the pin assembly, whereas this one right here is just connected to the gearing. And so it takes many, many revolutions here in order to make, say, one revolution on this gear assembly. So you got four coils, two here, two here, and iron teeth. And so at any point in time, there's gonna be two sets of iron teeth uh, with magnetic polarity applied. So just say you have 12 volts being applied with the number one wire here between this one in common. And so this will be north and this will be south. Then with the number two wire, you'd have this will be north and this will be south. And then third wire, you'd have this would be south and this would be north. And then the fourth wire would be that this is south and this is north. And so Every single one of these teeth is offset from each other, and so it's constantly gonna be turning that magnet on the inside of here a little at a time each time that you're powering the 12 volt uh, coils in sequence. Now we're gonna put this assembly all back together, and I'm gonna connect this to a little electrical project that we made in order to raise or lower the pin assembly. EEVs like this right here and like this style right here get powered with 12 volt power pulses. And so we have eight batteries in series at 1.5 volts a piece, so that's 12 volts total. And so we have our positive wire connected to the two commons. And so one common goes to one coil and the other common goes to the other coil. Then you have your four wires that are getting powered. So you have your yellow, your orange, your blue, and your white. And so you have two of those wires connected here and two of those wires connected here. And so we're gonna be replicating 12 volt pulses to each one of these. So one here, one here, one here, and one here. Now we have our negative wire from our battery bank coming in here and going to each one of these switches in order to be able to power this anytime that this button is pressed. So now I'm gonna go ahead and press this button. You have to pay special attention to the gears and it's, it's not gonna be much. It's gonna be a very, very tiny movement. So very, very minimal movement. So this gear right here is attached to that pin assembly. And so if you see four pulses, one, two, three, four, and you barely see any movement, that tells you how much, uh, how many power pulses it needs in order to fully close this or fully open it. It's actually 4,000 of these individual pulses in order to be able to push this all the way down. Now let me just take this little gear, as you can see this little gear on the top, I'm gonna move it up in order to then end up moving this. And you can see, finally, you can see our pin is actually moving. It takes a lot, a lot of spinning in order to get that pin all the way down. And there you can see it's all the way down and all the way up. Let me take you in for an up close image of this as well. So 
So I like to have students look at the tiny little gear on the inside and the very slight movement every time these little 12 volt pulses are applied to each one of the four coils. So 4,000 pulses for fully up to fully down compared to an EEV that directly drives the pin, such as this right here. So you can see this little top piece right here, it's actually moving every time I apply a 12 volt pulse to each one of the four coils and it's directly driving the pin clockwise, or in this case, we can go counterclockwise in order to rise or lower the pin. And so with this style right here, when you have the magnet directly connected onto the pin, it's gonna move a lot faster up and down. And in this case, it's only gonna have maybe uh, right around 240 pulses, but we can get this to move pretty, pretty rapidly just by applying these 12 volt pulses real quickly. So let's just go ahead and watch that pin move. So that's all the way up. Now in reference to troubleshooting an EEV on an indoor unit, you can actually, with the power off, check the electrical resistance value on the coil's wires right here to determine if the coils are intact. And so you can check this with the electrical resistance function on your multimeter. I also wanna point out that during operation, while this thing is running, it's not constantly sending 12 volt pulses to the EEV. It's only sending those pulses to that EEV head in order to put it into the position it wants it at. And then after that, it's no longer sending those 12 volt pulses. So it's just sitting there with that pin at a certain position in the non-powered state. So let's go ahead and check the electrical resistance function over here now. So I'm just doing this on the table so that you can see, but for this six wire EEV, we've got one of our probes into one of the two commons. The two commons on this one are right on the end. They are brown and red. And so you need to make sure to not use a probe that's larger like this. You definitely need the extensions to make them smaller. And so we can check the electrical resistance value of the coils inside the head of this EEV. And so we're not gonna have any electrical resistance between our brown and red because they are two separate common wires from two separate sets of coils. Now let's check over here in the blue, so blue to brown. We have 198.2 ohms. And then we go over from brown to orange and we have nothing. And that's because that's a separate, separate coil. So let's go over between brown and yellow. And 203 ohms, that's very close to our other measurement of the 198. And so those two coils are intact. And this one right here, once again, you have OL. Now we're gonna switch our probe over to the other common tap, which is now red. So that's red and white and we have 221 ohms. And so let's go over to the orange, which was reading OL with our other common before. And there we read 215 ohms of electrical resistance. So this, this one right here is good uh, for this coil. And that's because our red wire is connected over to our orange and our white. And then our brown is connected to the blue and to the yellow. And so you can use the manufacturer's uh, troubleshooting guide as far as to determine what the electrical resistance value should be. And so if you read OL between one of the commons and one of the coil wires that is supposed to be connected, then you'd know that the coil was burnt apart and bad. But in this case, our wire coils are intact and are good. So with any one of these EEVs, you're not gonna be able to measure the direct current voltage being applied to these because it happens so rapidly, your multimeter is just not gonna be able to pick it up. So. Uh, the, the main thing that you're going to be doing is with the power off, just checking the electrical resistance of the coils here just to see if they are intact. A couple of the other things that could uh, be problems besides these coils burning out is the gearings could end up uh, wearing out over time or getting jammed. And this seal right down here, the little gasket could wear out over time and it could potentially start to leak from this connection spot. And so that's some of the things that could happen on this style EEV, which is found in VRF systems, mini VRF systems, and some inverter mini split systems. And if you wanna learn about inverter mini splits, make sure to check out our book, which covers all the little electrical components inside and also their troubleshooting, as well as all the refrigerant related practices used in order to service these systems. So we have this book as well as a workbook available at our website at acservicetech.com. And we also have those resources available on Amazon. 
Hope you enjoyed yourself, and we'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.